Once upon a time, monsters became rampant on the western continent. In fear, people built castles and moats and trained their warriors. However, humans were still no match for them. Until one day, a traveler arrived and changed their fate. At present, Princess Sally of the Alderaki Kingdom orders the royal guards to stop chasing her. As she wants to see the outside world and go on a journey, she then runs into a traveler and asks him to lie to the guards about her whereabouts, to which he agrees. The guards, thinking that the stranger is a female traveler, tell him to be careful out there. Then they go in the false direction he gave them. Seeing the guards leave, Sally appears from the bushes and introduces herself to her new friend, a traveler named Miko. She then invites him to eat her favorite pastry, and the owners laugh at her for yet another trouble. She takes him around the market and later invites him to the palace to have dinner. In return, she asks him to tell her more about his travels, noting that she wants to leave her boring kingdom and travel the world. Miko points out that her kingdom is beautiful and peaceful, and anyone would be happy to settle there. The princess agrees, but she hates the fact that her life revolves around the kingdom and nothing else. She bids him good night and exits the hall. While outside the city walls, two monsters are looking over the palace. The next day, Sally enters Miko's room and is surprised to find him flatter and skinnier than herself. She's even more shocked when she learns that Miko is actually a boy. While walking in the castle grounds, Miko shares tales of his journeys with Sally. She jokingly remarks that if someone as scrawny as Miko can travel, she should be able to do so as well. Sally asks Miko to take her with him, but his tone changes as he warns her about the dangers of his path, including the possibility of abandonment or even death. Despite this, he asks if she still wants to join him. Sally is taken aback, and Miko clarifies that he was joking. Inside the castle, Sally's father, the king, meets with a stranger who reveals himself to be a monster named Yaki. The monster demands 30 bodies a month as tribute to spare Alderaki from slaughter. When a knight intervenes, the monster kills him, stating that the sacrifice doesn't count. After leaving the king's presence, the monster encounters Miko in the courtyard with the princess. He begins to worry and decides to call off his plan. Cutting off Sally's conversation, Miko senses the monster and shows a twisted smile, pursuing him without Sally realizing it. Inside the castle, there is chaos as everyone debates how to deal with the new threat. The king approaches Sally and advises her to embark on her own journey, realizing the danger of her staying. As a rumbling noise fills the air, Sally hurries outside to investigate. Witnessing monsters for the first time, she decides to get closer. In the field, a group of ogres with their leader, Moki, is approached by Yaki. He informs Moki that their plan is off, as the one who destroyed Yaki's country is in the castle. Miko approaches the ogres, catching Moki's attention, who gets excited about slaying him. Sally intervenes, urging Miko to leave immediately, but he ignores her and directs his attention to Moki, who introduces himself. After Miko introduces himself as well, the former strikes first with a punch, but Miko cuts his hand off. He activates his peach eyes, puts a bandana with a peach logo on his forehead, and slices the ogre's bodies. It is revealed that Miko is from another land, and that he kills monsters for pleasure. Miko slaughters the horde with pure bloodlust, and approaches the bleeding Moki. He asks Miko who he is, to which he responds that he is a helpless traveler who hunts monsters and then goes to kill the enemy. At the gate, Sally feels torn about how Miko saved her kingdom, as he did it in a terrifying way. Suddenly a dog shows up, and the boy says it's time to go. Sally pleads with him to stay and runs after him, but she gets stopped by the grotesque sight in front of her. The boy keeps walking, and Sally shouts after him, only realizing he's been gone for a month, and she's still thinking about him. She then decides to tell her father she's going on an adventure. She happily chops off her hair to show how serious she is, saying she's done being a princess. To her surprise, her father is supportive of her decision. King asks if she has a plan, and she says she'll figure it out as she travels. She bids her father goodbye, and heads out in her travel clothes, excited to start her journey. While on her journey, Sally comes across a human-like rabbit passed out in the forest, noting that she hasn't seen anything like it so far. She leaves it to avoid trouble, but she hears the creature's stomach grumbling. Unable to ignore it, she fetches a carrot from her bag and offers it as food. The rabbit introduces herself as Frau, a harefolk. Sally notes that this is the first time she has seen a demi-human. She then shows the rabbit a poor sketch of Miko, asking if she has seen the boy. However, the creature isn't familiar with the boy, 
and thanks Sally for the delicious food. Against Sally's wishes, Frau begins to follow her, as traveling alone is dangerous. The two eventually arrive at a nearby village, where they meet a villager who isn't welcoming to a demi-human. He tells Frau to leave, as they can't let a demi-human enter the village, as they view them as a blunder. The villager welcomes Sally instead, but after a brief flashback to Miko, she decides to leave with Frau. Later, Sally gives Frau her raincoat to hide her appearance, and the two re-enter the village in the hopes of finding food and shelter. They run into the village lord, who welcomes them as travelers. Upon seeing some carrots, Frau is unable to conceal her excitement and reveals herself. However, the lord seems to be understanding and isn't phased by her appearance, and he offers them to stop by his mansion to treat them to dinner. That night, the two join the lord for dinner, who also offers them his place to stay the night. While leading Sally to her room, the Lord tells her that their region was once damaged by monsters and killed many people. Fortunately, a lone traveler single-handedly slaughtered the monsters, saving them from being completely annihilated. Sally recognizes this to be Miko and asks about his whereabouts, but the Lord is clueless. He regrets that they weren't able to properly show gratitude to the hero, so in return, they welcome all travelers with open arms. Hearing this, Sally questions why he let Frau enter the village. He tells her of the inferiority of the demi-human people. He says that in the end, they are no different than regular demons, and they are in fact the enemies of mankind. Sally wakes up to a large, crashing sound and finds that a demon has landed in the village. She approaches the ogre and freezes instantly in fear. Realizing she is in danger, Frau comes to her rescue and kills the ogre with two kicks. Meanwhile, somewhere in the forest, a group of men riding horses are observing the happenings in the village. Sally thanks Frau for saving her, while the villagers remain terrified of the demi-human for its power. The lord of the village asks them to leave, but Frau approaches the lord and thanks him for the carrot, much to everyone's surprise. Leaving the village, they are surrounded and then arrested by members of the Rimdarl Knights. Later they are imprisoned in a cell, but the man earlier, Hawk, releases them and introduces himself as the regimental commander of the Royal Knights. The princess thinks it's foolish to detain them because she's traveling with a demi-human, but the commander clarifies that Frau also poses a threat because of her strength. However, witnessing Frau saving Sally and giving respect to the villagers, he had a change of heart. He decides to release them, but not before giving in to their demand for food before they go. They then walk around the market to get lunch. Meanwhile, outside the city, two monsters named Mary and Set are planning to wreak havoc on the land. Mary uses her ogre blast and destroys the kingdom's walls. Due to using too much power, she takes on a childlike form while regaining her strength. Set enters the walls and immediately annihilates the guards. Hawk tells Sally that they must run, but she keeps approaching the ogre, seemingly out of herself. Frau comes to her rescue and lands a kick at Set. She then tells Sally to run fast, but the latter refuses to leave her. Hawk then drags her away, leaving Frau against the massive walrus. The rabbit vows to protect Sally by treating her kindly, much to the ogre's amusement. Meanwhile, as Hawk is busy evacuating the people, he notices that Sally is missing. The hare folk and the walrus fight. Set successfully catches Frau and throws her in the air. As she is falling, tear-strained Sally calls out to her. This gives Frau renewed strength, and she fights the walrus head on. Frau is heavily injured, and she is joined by Sally. Seeing them together, the ogre decides to finish them both, but suddenly Sally feels hot and her eyes glow red. In an instant, she cuts the walrus hand. Like Miko, her eyes turn peach and she feels an uncontrollable urge to kill ogres. Mary sits under a big tree, thinking that Set is having a good time slaughtering humans. Suddenly, a mysterious figure emerges from behind the tree and inquires why she is sighing. Surprised by the unexpected company and unable to sense another presence, she views it as a way to pass time while waiting for her comrade and tries to activate her powers. However, to her shock, the tree was effortlessly sliced down. The stranger, revealed to be Miko, expresses a desire to join in the fun and questions if the earlier explosion was her doing. He then mentions that he wouldn't find it enjoyable to slay her, as she is regenerating her powers, and suggests having a little talk while waiting. Meanwhile, Set laughs as he finally meets someone worthy to fight him. Sally, still in her powerful state, easily blocks the ogre's attack, who then starts to wonder what kind of monster she is. On the other hand, Mary asks Miko if he is the notorious traveling demon slayer everyone is talking about. 
He is impressed that she heard about him, and asks why they break into the town and kill humans inside the city. Mary answers that humans have destroyed the natural world that other species need to live in to build their castles. She regards them as enemies of her kind, and slowly reverts to her original form. He mocks her for her love for nature, but points out that, deep down, she just wants revenge against those who stole her land. It's not as if she'll stop attacking humans if they suddenly become considerate of nature. Mary declares that five minutes have passed, and uses her ogre eyes to activate her power. She calls Miko dangerous, and is determined to finish him. He laughs and activates his peach eyes, telling her that she is free to try. Meanwhile, back in the kingdom, Set also tells Sally that she is dangerous, and proceeds to use his ogre cannon against the princess. Mary hears the explosion, and becomes distracted for a moment. Miko uses this chance to attack, telling the girl to focus on their fight. He realizes that his opponent is using Xi'an magic, and is impressed by her technique. Seeing him determined to fight her, she asks him if he's not going to save the humans her comrade is annihilating at the moment. Miko clarifies that his driving force is not to save humans, but to slay ogres. He then dispels her ogre eyes easily. Back in the kingdom, as the dust settles, Set is shocked that Sally manages to survive unscathed. She then unsheathes her sword and slashes her enemy, defeating him in the process, but then passes out. Miko urges Mary to use her ogre cannon against him and promises not to dodge. To convince her, he even wounds his own leg with his katana, shocking the girl. Insulted, she uses the cannon, but as expected, the boy survives the attack unscratched. Now in her child form, Miko pushes the girl to the ground and points his sword at her, aiming to slay her. Mary asks for his name, and he introduces himself, saying that he is a sworn enemy of the ogres. He then stabs her eye and cuts her horn, revealing that they are the source of her ogre powers. His talking dog appears, asking why he hasn't killed him. Miko tells him that without her power, she is no different than a human, and that is a way for him to torture her. However, the dog doesn't agree, saying that he takes pity on her because he saw himself in Mary. The dog also points out that Miko already senses Sally inside the city. However, Miko refuses to see the princess, whom he calls his kindred spirit. They then leave the city. As the sun sets, a mysterious figure appears, saying that he has found the person he is looking for. Meanwhile, Sally wakes up from her injuries and sees Frau, who is staying next to her. As her memories are still hazy, she doesn't remember what happened in the city. Hawk appears, saying she defeated the ogre. The man then gives her her sword, confirming that she annihilates the walrus ogre. He then asks them to follow him, and they find themselves in a cell, which shocks them as they think they are being arrested once again. Hawk tells them that it's not the case, and shows them a girl sleeping in a cell. He tells them that she is the ogre who blasted the city walls. However, the princess tells him that the girl looks like an ordinary human to her. Hawk tells him that monsters can take human appearances, and reveals that the girl will most likely be executed while she's sleeping. However, he thinks it's too cruel, so he must wait for the girl's side of things. Sally commends the man for his decision, and offers to stay in the cell to guard the girl. As the commander leaves, Frau tells Sally that the girl is actually pretending to be asleep. She asks Mary if she remembers anything, but Mary tells them that she is an ogre, and tries to attack Frau to no avail. Seeing her little punches, Sally takes a liking to Mary, saying she looks adorable. She then realizes that her power is gone, thanks to Miko. Hearing Miko's name, Sally finally believes that Mary is an ogre and demands to tell her what happened. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, an ogre kills its kind and heads toward the city. Back in the cell, Sally is happy to hear that Miko is possibly just around the corner and plans to go after him. She promises Mary that she won't tell anyone she's an ogre to ensure her safety. Now that her powers are gone, the ogre prefers to die, but this annoys Sally, and she orders Frau to help them escape. Meanwhile, a guard reports to Hawk that the prisoner has escaped, and that Sally and Frau helped her. As they are running away from the guards, Hawk appears, refusing to let them escape as a knight. Frau kicks the commander out of the way, and they continue to run fast. As the guard hands Hawk his horse's reins, the whole kingdom is suddenly wiped out, much to everyone's shock. Mary is surprised to see the high ogre, Soman, who is responsible for wiping out the whole city. He mocks Mary, saying that he doesn't understand why slaughtering a single kingdom is hard for her. Seeing her without a horn, and her Xian, Soman calls her a human, insisting that she should die now with dignity. She surrenders to his command, 
ready to offer her life. But Sally intervenes, refusing to let her sacrifice. However, now that her power hasn't been activated, she asks Frau what to do. The rabbit urges her to fight, noting that she defeated the walrus ogre. Hearing this, Soman proceeds to attack, interested in seeing her power. However, a voice named Miraji telepathically stops the ogre from attacking, ordering him to spare Sally from his hit list. Meanwhile, Miragi can be seen talking from an abandoned church, telling Soman to retreat and go back immediately. The high ogre leaves the humans, following the orders of his higher up. As the sun rises, Sally is relieved that they are spared. She then remembers Hawk and checks on the man. She snaps him back to reality, saying they're in a dire situation right now as they don't have any supplies. She tells him to gather himself because, at the moment, they need to survive first. Realizing she's right, Hawk comes to his senses but is still too confused to lead the team to the closest village. Familiar with the local terrain, Mary steps up and tells them that there's a city that's a half-day walk to the west. Frau pats her head, calling her a good girl for helping everyone. The group then heads to the west and arrives in a village where people are wary of them. They try to stay at an inn, but the owner drives them away, seeing that they're with a demi-human. Hawk introduces himself to the man, who immediately recognizes him as the commander of the Knights of Rimdarl. Trusting him, the owner let them stay in one of the rooms. Hawk gives Sally money to buy them food, assuring her that he's feeling better after her pep talk. However, once Sally leaves the room, he turns off his brave face and cries. Frau tries to cheer him up, telling him that everything will be better in time. The commander thanks her for the kind words and goes downstairs to fetch some water. Alone, Mary comments that Frau is unbelievably close to humans as a demi-human. The rabbit tells her that her world changed when she met Sally, as she showed her care and concern. She then invites Mary to join their travels, calling her a child as she doesn't know her human name. Mary suggests she give her a human name instead. As she loves carrots, she calls her Carrot, which the former ogre reluctantly accepts. Meanwhile, Sally walks around the city, thinking of how she'll buy food for four people. She sits down and contemplates her situation, thinking that she never thought about the prejudice against other species before. While she's in deep thought, she spots Miko and his talking dog companion. They sit down, and deep inside her, Sally is thrilled to see the boy again. Miko notices her short hair, saying that it suits her. He also notes that she has probably been through a lot during her journey. She shares that during her journey, she witnessed how people treat demi-humans with contempt, and nobody seems to question it. However, Miko's aura changes, and he asks a hypothetical question for the princess. What if a demi-human kills a human? How would she think the child of the human would feel? Sally thinks that the child will be sad at first, but Miko cuts her, saying he would hate the demi-humans that killed his family. He will then annihilate all of the monsters without hesitation. The boy then smiles and tells her it is all hypothetical, but adds that people hate demi-humans because they were brought up like that. Meanwhile, Miragi is watering the plants in a church, posing as a priest. An orphan girl proudly shows him the pastries she baked and runs to the other kids. However, Soman shows up and devours the child. Seeing his comrade, he warns him about going against the princess, as she could kill him, which Soman finds impossible. Sally decides to travel to bridge demi-humans and humans, and make each species try to understand each other. Miko warns her that it's not an easy feat. However, the girl just smiles at him, saying she can handle a little pain. She invites the boy to join her on her journey, but he refuses as he wants to travel alone. They promise to exchange stories of their travels if they ever run into each other, and then Miko departs. As he's walking, he refuses to take another look at the princess, as he might end up taking her offer, so he's running away instead. Sally goes back to the inn, and is surprised that Hawk takes in a boy named Barrett, who was once his soldier. Having survived the destruction, the boy recounts that the Witch of the Western Forest saved him from the chaos caused by Soman. Hearing this, Sally declares that she wants to meet the Witch, much to everyone's surprise. That night, Carrot meets Miragi in the forest. He offers to take her again as an ogre, although she has already lost her horn, on the condition that she continues to travel with her current party and reports to him everything that is happening. Before leaving, Miragi tells her she can use her ogre eye to look at Sally, and she'll see something interesting. The next day, Sally and others arrive at the witch's dwelling, surprised at how big it is. Sally is surprised to discover that the witch's house is a bar. The witch then comes forward and introduces herself as Winnie, 
To everyone's surprise, Sally asks the witch to teach her magic. Having observed her humanity in her crystal ball, Winnie agrees to teach her. However, she has three conditions. First, she must keep the teachings secret. Second, she must obey her all the time. And third, a million gold coins are her payment, which shocks Sally. Given their current situation, Winnie offers to accept any amount of money, but Hawk points out that since they're traveling, they can't splurge further. Realizing that he's right, Sally requests that Hawk teach him swordsmanship instead. Later, as the two practice, Carrot uses her ogre eye on Sally and sees an enormous amount of magic inside the princess, which surprises her. As it has gotten pretty late, the group wonders where they will be staying. Winnie offers the spare rooms in her bar for free, as long as they'll clean them. She then calls for Hawk and shows him the power Sally possesses and how she defeated Set. Later, Frau enters Winnie's room, revealing that they had known each other three years ago. Winnie mysteriously states that Frau sealed her power and feigned ignorance in the guise of a hair folk. She doesn't push the topic further and shows her the weapon she prepares for the rabbit, saying she saw her using a mallet earlier. She thanks Winnie and asks her a favor to teach Sally magic. As a sign of respect for their friendship, Winnie agrees and tells her to pay her a million later on. She then offers to make the rabbit carrot juice, much to Frau's delight. The next day, Sally is thrilled to know that Winnie finally agrees to teach her magic. To prepare her body, the witch orders the princess to train with Frau first to improve her stamina. Seeing her disappointment, Winnie reminds her that, as her teacher, she has to obey her at all times. Determined to learn magic, Sally starts running with Frau. Meanwhile, Carrot watches from the sidelines, noting to herself that Winnie must have realized that Sally holds immense power, yet she's saying nothing and wonders what her plan is. Next, Hawk trains with her and assures her that he won't raise his sword against her. The princess aggressively attacks him, but he only blocks her attacks. However, he remembers her fight with Set, which Winnie should have won. The witch then asks him if he would consider the girl evil. At present, Sally complains that Hawk uses a hand against her. The man clarifies that he only uses her foot and helps her stand up. Watching the two, Winnie reminisces about Hawk's grandfather, Maruya, and tells him that he raised a kind grandson just like him. Just then, an elf and a lizard folk appear, looking for Winnie. They request that she remove the barrier in the southeast forest and kill the ogre she sealed there. In the bar, Winnie questions why they want to suddenly eliminate the sleeping ogre. The two demons reveal that they have been preparing for it, and since it has not rained, it's their chance to burn the ogre. She agrees, but on the condition that Sally and her group join the extermination party. The next day, Sally and the others are present while Winnie is dispelling the seal she put on the ogre. Sally asks the lizard folk why they need to exterminate a sleeping ogre. The demon replies that a kingdom has recently been annihilated, so they can't just leave a dangerous ogre. Meanwhile, Hawk approaches the elven chief and criticizes his decision to send the lizard folk deep into the forest with poor visibility. He accuses him of sacrificing the lizard folk before sending his elves into the fight. Sally tries to intervene, but the elven chief acknowledges that Hawk is right. He doesn't mince words and tells Sally that he planned to abandon the lizard folk and doesn't care if they will come after him once the fight with the ogre is over. He states that the hostility between races runs far deeper than she imagined. Just then, an ogre named Hatsuki emerges from the seal. She recognizes Carrot, whom she takes pity on for losing all her powers and hanging out with humans. To help her former comrade, she offers to end her miserable life while smiling much to Sally's disbelief. Hatsuki then tries to attack the princess using her ogre hair, but Frau is quick to protect the girl. Winnie watches Hatsuki and wonders where she came from, as she's not the sealed ogre. Just then, an earthquake vibrates deep from underground, and the sealed high ogre, Juki, shows itself. Winnie volunteers to buy time for everyone to run, but Sally refuses this idea. Meanwhile, it is revealed that Miragi is the mastermind behind the commotion and sends Hatsuki to stir things up. They then spot Miko traveling alone, and Soman approaches the boy as he's hungry. However, to Miragi's shock, the boy easily kills his partner, revealing that he is not just an ordinary lone traveler, but the infamous demon slayer. Meanwhile, the tree ogre wishes to kill Winnie for sealing him for a long time. Hawk lays out a plan to defeat the high ogre, with the elves and lizard folk working together. Even during a war, Sally is glad to see the different races working together to defeat an ogre. However, even before the war starts, 
Sally announces that they all should make peace, much to everyone's surprise. The ogre picks her up, saying peace is not possible since ogres are born of human hatred and are therefore destined to fight and hate humans. Juki calls her pathetic for even thinking of peace between humans and ogres, noting that she's delusional. As Frau tries to save Sally, Hatsuki intervenes, saying they should fight instead. Meanwhile, Miko tries to fight with Miragi, but the ogre disagrees and points out that Miko is not very civilized for a human. As she's about to be crushed by the tree monster, Sally finally activates her peach eyes, saying she can't let hatred be the death of her. She then breaks free from the roots, much to everyone's shock. Winnie immediately approaches her, making sure that she's in control of herself this time. Seeing her power, Juki points out that if they're born of human hatred, then she is on the opposite side of the coin and can easily wipe out the ogres. He tells her that she can't talk about peace and compromise, as her very existence is a threat to all of the ogres. However, if she wants to make peace, she should slay herself first. Hearing this, Sally realizes that there's no other way but for her to fight. She declares that they either peacefully end the war or die in her hands. Tired of her nonsense, Milia attacks Sally with her ogre hair. Frau tries to intervene, but the princess stops her. She then easily breaks the ogre's hair, which is known to be as hard as steel. She punches Milia on the stomach, making her collapse on the ground. The tree ogre turns its attention to Milia, whom it has determined is weak and has no place in this world, even though they're the same race. He then attacks the young ogre using his roots, but to Milia's surprise, Sally steps in and defends her. She then declares that she'll use her powers on monsters like him, who don't see reason anymore, and are determined to end the tree ogre. She charges at Juki and unleashes a single punch, which obliterates the monster. After using immense power, Sally becomes exhausted. Winnie congratulates Sally and thanks her for saving all of them and the forest from destruction. The lizard folk and the elves express their gratitude as well to the human girl for saving all of them from extinction. Sally then falls asleep after using too much of her powers. Just then, Hawk notices that Milia is not around. It is then revealed that the girl ran away deep into the forest. That night, Carrot sent an ogre eye to check on Miragi. However, instead of reporting, she questions what his goals are, knowing that he sent Milia to revive Juki. As he's getting furious, Carrot reports how the fight ensued. She then discovers that Soman had a fight with Miko, and she wonders how Miragi survived. He replies that he was able to negotiate with the Demon Slayer and talk about Sally's potential. The next day, Sally wakes up and finds Hawk sitting at the bar, having a conversation with the elf and lizard man leaders. She can't believe her plan is coming together, seeing that races can interact peacefully. Seeing her happy, Winnie tells her she must not forget the feeling, as it will guide her throughout her journey. Later, Sally announces that she needs to continue her journey as much as possible, as her recent encounters with ogres are not coincidental. She thinks someone is following her to test her abilities, so it will be dangerous to stay in one place for a long period of time. Hearing this, Hawk, Frau, and Carrot decide to join her journey, much to her delight. Sally invites Winnie to join them as well, but the witch respectfully declines, saying that she'll keep the bar open for them instead. Bidding goodbye to their friends, the group then continues their journey. A woman walks at night and screams as she encounters a terrifying man with sharp fangs. Meanwhile, Hawk is telling Sally about a vampire in the upcoming town, warned by the guard at the checkpoint. Recently, they've been finding corpses in the morning, drained of their blood and branded with two fang bites on the neck. Afraid, she suggests camping outside town instead, but he insists that there's no need to worry, as it only targets beautiful women, and she doesn't fit the criteria. After a hit on his face, they move forward. They decide to look for an inn first, but quickly notice that everyone is giving them dirty looks because of their demi-human companion. As they reluctantly proceed, Carrot suddenly suggests that Sally teach them a lesson. However, her disappointment in the young woman grows as she argues that she can't use her powers like that. They reach an inn, but worry that they won't be offered a room with Frau there. The hair folk offers to sneak in later, after buying things they might need. As Carrot accompanies her, she feels bad about Sally refusing to hurt humans, but agreeing to have demi-humans compromise instead. Frau wants to buy a hood to disguise herself, but gets distracted by a stall selling carrots. Unfortunately, she's met with hostility from the vendor, throwing her change on the ground despite her buying politely. The former ogre's heart breaks, 
as she sees her friend pick the coins up silently. At their room, Hawk expresses his worry for Carrot, as she's never experienced human animosity before. When she sees the discrimination her friend goes through, she might not take it so well. As Frau happily munches on her snack, the ogre wonders what's wrong with the humans of the town. She's shocked to hear that nearly all humans act that way. The demi-human doesn't fight back, simply because she's gotten used to it, adding that those like Sally make things better. However, Carrot argues that she'll always side with humans during the most important times, recalling how Set died by her hands. As she walks away, she hears the residents belittling demi-humans and wants to slaughter them all. Just then, they talk about the vampire roaming around, giving her an idea. Using her eye, she finds a familiar power source. While Sally is searching for her friends, a vendor offers her some octopus. Remembering her traumatic experience, her power suddenly activates. At a building's ruins, Carrot visits Kyukatsuki, the blood-sucking ogre. As a favor, she asks him to slaughter the humans of the city, revealing how she lost her power and the situation with Sally. Hearing this, the idea of battle gives thrill to his boring life and prompts him to hunger for the mysterious girl's blood. He's in disbelief as Carrot argues against it. The girl is a threat to ogre kind, and thus the one they need to kill the most. She struggles to agree, but fortunately, Frau arrives and invites her to come back home. Kyukatsuki excuses himself to kill the human. That said, they have business now as well, so the demi-human smashes her mallet onto the ground. The ogre is too slow, but her attacks lack power. He easily gets a hold of her and bears his fangs, which were his ogre horns all along. Driving it into her neck, he causes it to explode. Sally arrives just in time to see her entire upper body blown off. She charges at the enemy. He's shocked as a single hit causes him to cough up blood. Wondering what her power is, he controls his blood and uses his own to attack the girl. Unfortunately for him, it doesn't work at all, and she's filled with rage at what he just did. He wounds himself and scatters his blood over her, using it to act as taut threads that hold her down. He bears his fangs again, but Carrot sends a blast his way. Realizing that the former ogre and the human are the same, he decides to kill them together. Frau wakes up in a bright plane. There, she encounters an angel named Atla, who says they're in heaven, and says she's died twice that year already. Hearing that her upper half got blasted off, the angel offers to have her live there instead, but she says that her companions are waiting. For now, the demi-human needs to be revived, adding that she plans to use a bit of power, regardless of the consequences. With a warm thank you, she's sent back to the living realm. Frau's body regenerates, but she has a sinister look in her eyes. Black wings sprout out of her back, and her hands are tainted with darkness. Recalling her odd-tasting blood, he says she isn't just hair folk, and launches his ball of coagulated blood at her. However, a wave of her hand blasts it away, and he isn't even able to react as she drives a hole into his chest. With this, she reaches her limit and loses consciousness. Kyukatsuki doesn't judge Carrot for betraying the ogres, as he did the same when he fell for a human. He wed her and lived a life of bliss, so much so that he forgot his true nature. On the day that he proposed to her, they moved in to kiss, but his instincts took over. Before he knew it, she was sucked dry of her blood. As he falls, he expresses his envy over her losing her horns and tells them to sneak Frau away while it's dark. Frau wakes up in the inn, still in her new form. Seeing Atla, she thinks that she died again, but that isn't the case. According to the angel, her friends brought her back and took care of her after the fight, unconcerned about her odd appearance. That said, to help her fit in more, she retrieves the power she employed. The demi-human thanks her friend, grateful for her companionship. Hawk soon enters after hearing voices and delightfully sees her back to normal. While shopping for carrots, the two ladies get into an argument, as Sally admits that she killed Set. Refusing to apologize, she insists that she used her power only because she had to. Just then, a vendor tells them not to argue in front of his stall and recognizes Carrot as the one accompanying the demi-human. He spouts insults at demi-humans, calling them beasts worse than livestock. The ogre starts to get mad, but the human punches him before she can do anything. Meanwhile, Alta flies from above and sees Kyukatsuki's spirit wandering in the realm. Asking for a bit more time, he watches the people burn his body on a stake. The vendor is in disbelief that a human is accompanied by a demi-human. However, he stops and tells them to leave, 
terrified by Sally's burning glare. Walking away, Carrot thinks about the human's words and smiles as she finally understands what type of person she is. That said, she questioned that people like the vendor could really make peace with demi-humans. While it might not work all the time, punching him allowed her to see the ogre's smile, adding that her happiness and anger were both for Frau's sake. Right now, she's neither ogre nor human, a compromise that might not be so bad. Kyukatsuki watches his body burn, as it's the least he could do, after living three centuries. She hopes he's reborn as something other than an ogre, but the thought of living as a vile human isn't appealing to him. That said, they agree that not all humans are bad. He brings up the being disguised as hair folk and questions if the unnatural creature is supposed to be on that plane. As he asks what it is, his wedding ring falls, and the time to go has come. The angel helps him cross over, and he hopes for Carrot to meet a more fortunate fate. Glad to see Frau back to normal, they wonder what she is, but don't force her to explain. Hawk suggests going out, but they can't, as Sally will probably be investigated for hitting a vendor in the street. The demi-human asks what happened, and agrees that he deserved it, as the former knight is dragging her to jail. At night, Miko walks through the woods with his dog, noticing a lone bandit following them. The boy dashes in to attack, but is surprised to see Milia, whom he oddly identifies as a common nun. Despite her hesitation, he offers her a bowl of food and asks what she's doing in the mountains. With this, she reveals that she's suffering from amnesia and only remembers her name. As she sleeps at night, he takes her hood off and confirms who she is. Ready to take her out, the dog stops him, so he points his sword at it, questioning if he's on the side of ogres. Furious, the dog scolds him, insisting that he's on the side of Miko, ordering the boy not to sully the name. He drops his sword and agrees to take her to the next village. Lastly, he apologizes for aiming his sword at the dog. The next morning, the chicken ogres attack them, but they're no match for the boy's strength. However, as they speak of ogres, memories begin to flash through Milia's head. They reach the edge of the forest, and he suggests that he go into the nearby city. Just then, a mid-ogre appears, ordered to capture the pathetic runaway, who's clinging to humans. Seeing him, Miko tries to explain that she lost her memory. However, as he mentions Juki, her memories come back, and so does the trauma. He slashes across her chest, and she hates how she's fallen to a nameless mid-ogre. Meanwhile, the human finds them boring, and says he'll just kill whoever wins their battle. Understanding her hopeless situation, she rips her horn off, telling Miko that she's no longer an ogre, and asking for his help. She falls from blood loss, but she doesn't want to die, as she still wants to meet Sally, gaze into her demonic eyes, and rebuke her. Suddenly, she wakes up in a room, all bandaged up but safe nonetheless. Beside her is the young human, who says he spared the mid-ogre, as she was losing too much blood to waste time. Immediately understanding the gap in their powers, the ogre let them go. She brightly thanks him for saving her, and insists on joining his travels. He reluctantly allows it, not really wanting her to die right after he saved her. She acts friendly, even addressing him as her best buddy, blissfully unaware and in denial that he's a man. A match at an arena finishes, with Hawk emerging as the victor. He laughs and gloats in joy, but his companions respond sarcastically, praising him for getting a weak opponent. That said, he plans on winning the tournament and earning a huge amount of money. Not bothering to watch, they leave and tell him to return when he's done. They assume that he's in it for the money, but Frau says it's more about his heart's desire to be strong enough to protect others. As someone who's only seen human violence, Carrot begins to understand their hearts, giving Sally hope that peace between races is possible. Just then, she sees Miko passing by and runs after him. Despite their overdue reunion, all he can offer her is some water, since his funds have run dry from feeding the nun. Barely able to afford a room for himself, he told her to earn money for her meals. With this, the source of his problems decided to enter the tournament, hoping to win the prize money. At night, the mid-ogre apologizes for failing to capture Milia. Miragi says it wasn't his fault, and that his matchup was simply unfortunate. As he's talking about how the ogre ran from a single glare, a child suddenly approaches, telling him to pick her up. Reacting ignorantly, he's scolded by Soman for being disrespectful. He's then introduced to the girl, Juscelino, the god of masks. He immediately apologizes and places her on his shoulders. Together they walk to a nearby platform, where one of her masks has drawn a beautiful summoning circle. 
There, they're going to have the Hundred Ogre Gathering. As ogres emerge from the circle, Miragi welcomes them all and begins the 672nd Gathering. Gesturing to a map, he shows their sphere of influence on the continent before. Tearing the page off, he shows its current state, and the audience is shocked to see it massively reduced. An old and sophisticated-looking ogre speaks, taking everyone's attention as he asks if it's the Peach Boy. Confirmed, the leader says it's their night's topic, adding that it's the name of a single human. The others doubt that a lone human can hold such force, but the old man says it's true, adding that the boy's power exceeds that of any army. Miragi lists the names of the high ogres, including the boy recently killed, warning them all of extinction. Just then, Todoro, the thunder ogre, interjects. While he acknowledges the boy's power, he argues that fear is being unnecessarily stoked and suggests banding together instead. In response, the leader takes Soman's severed head out, insisting that fighting with numbers isn't always the answer. Annoyed by the boy's arguments, he brings up Carrot's ogre name and says she was killed by the Peach Boy as well. Driving the nail deeper, he says he wanted to keep the incidents quiet as she was slain in a cruel way, taking her dignity as an ogre away. The provocation works well, as Todoro vows to kill the boy on his own. Ending the gathering, they wish him well. Later, Soman cries out, humiliated that he was used as an example. He asks his master to repair him, but she takes his life completely instead. Chusolino asks if Miragi wants to get along with humans, doubting its probability. He says it's not impossible, as one of his friends shared love with a human before. Getting ready to leave, she tells him to keep her updated, as she isn't opposed to helping him. Watching him work, the mid-ogre can't help but feel like his plans are beyond humans and ogres. The next day, Juscelino appears before Hawk. She asks him to pick him up, saying she's looking for someone named Miragi. They introduce themselves to each other, but he's completely oblivious to what her title means. Amused, she asks to be friends, insisting that she gives her friends anything they want. He flicks her on the head and lectures the child about friendship being built on bonds. For a moment, she releases a sinister energy, intrigued that she was just lectured, but she returns to normal instantly. Just then, Miragi arrives. She runs to him, saying that she wants to see humans, since he is so interested in them. He introduces himself as a priest and sees Hawk's swords. Understanding that he's participating in the tournament, he encourages Husilino to cheer him on with all her heart. They part ways, as she promises to, and the former commander is completely unaware that the girl he became friends with was responsible for the annihilation of his old kingdom. Back in their inn, Melia is fired up and ready to win more matches. Miko has other things to do and can't cheer for her, but promises to pray that she doesn't get hurt. At the arena, Hawk is called on for his battle, and a loud cheer from Juscelino suddenly rings out from the stands. Amused, he decides to put on a show. As Sally is surprised by the crowd's noise, Miragi approaches her, introducing himself as someone who shares her goal of seeking peace between humans and ogres. Miko arrives and tells her to get away, revealing the strange man's identity. Considering the situation, the ogre admits to who he is, but adds that his influence and her power could make their dream of coexistence come true. However, hate seethes out of the boy as he's unwilling to let such a world materialize. Now, they both hold their hands out, wanting to help her reach their own goals and forcing her to make a decision. In front of her are Miko, whose path she doesn't want to stand on, and an ogre, whose path she shares. Regrets will follow, no matter what she chooses. As such, she walks to her old friend, whom she wants to stop, but also wants to be with. To her surprise, he steps back and rejects her, saying she can't choose him. Miragi encourages her to go after her choice and learn more about the boy. She catches up, and he apologizes for making a foolish offer, despite being well aware of her ideals. Hearing her insist, Miko glares at her, recalling his old question about hating all demi-humans if her parents were killed by one. His hatred for them overflows, so he kills them all without question. However, no amount of killing brings him relief. She asks what he would do if he stood between them as an advocate of coexistence. She was hopeful, but his expression alone made his answer clear. Just then, something blasts the town wall. It's Todoro, accompanied by Basso, Shinki, and Daminki. The eagle ogre flies to scout the area, and the sleeping boy is left outside. The two decide to separate and cause havoc. At the arena, the guard tells the participants 
that the tournament has been cancelled, as ogres are invading. Desperate for help, they offer 500 gold coins to whoever can bring an ogre's head. Based on the explosion, Hawk guesses that the enemies must be on Set's level. While ready to rely on his companions, an old opponent, Barsus, approaches and tries to ally with him. He doesn't make much and wants to earn money for his family. That said, he discourages the man, knowing the dangers of the beasts. Convinced, he gives up, but a huge blast of lightning strikes, killing him on the spot. Todoro appears, having meant to hit them both. Hawk correctly guesses that he's an ogre, but is mistakenly identified as Peach Boy. Meanwhile, Carrot takes a look at what's happening, and is surprised to Beso, Shinki, and finally Todoro. Sally wonders if Miragi was involved in the attack, but he suddenly appears behind her, hurt by the inference. While he could convince them to stop, he refused to help the girl, who had just rejected his allyship. He then explains how the weakest in their group is against the strongest ogre. However, he chooses to prevent her from saving him. Todoro shoots at Hawk, but the seasoned soldier throws his sword up to attract the lightning. Outside the walls, Miko tries to attack Daminki while he's sleeping, but he suddenly falls unconscious. The man's companions do their best to give him backup. However, they all encounter an obstacle, one way or another. Miragi taunts Sally, seemingly goading her to use her peach powers to drive him back. Hawk dodges the lightning strikes and runs to a dark ally with only his wooden sword. Annoyed, the boy chases after him, but is knocked unconscious after being hit with a surprise attack. Meanwhile, Shinki walks through the streets, feeling sad that everyone looks at him with fear. Carrot approaches him, asking why they're attacking the city. As he sees her, he suddenly laughs, saying they're there to avenge her, as Totoro was told that the Peach Boy killed her. She questions why Miragi would lie like that, and why the boy would even want to avenge her. Regardless, he should stop once he sees her, but the ogre won't let that happen, and decides to kill her himself. Meanwhile, Hawk's luck runs out, as Todoro stands up and sees his horn cover from Carrot on the ground. He guesses that they must have used trickery to kill her, and lets go of all inhibitions to slaughter him. At the same time, the others begin to get overwhelmed by the ogres, with Sally unable to activate the power in her eye. Todoro uses his cannon and conjures Raijin, a being made of pure lightning behind him. Shinki insists on killing Carrot, as she's a member of the Coexistence Faction, a group led by Miragi that wishes for the coexistence of ogres and humans. Moreover, she's the first to betray them and dwell with humans. Unable to reach a compromise, they charge at each other. Driven by their own reasons, the invaders overwhelm their enemies one by one, rendering them completely helpless. Evan Carrot is unable to do anything after losing her powers. Meanwhile, Juscelino and the mid-ogre watch as Hawk faces his death with a confident smile. It's clear that he has no escape, but it's also certain that his comrades are on their way to him. As such, his job now is to keep the boy in place long enough for them to come. He insists that he plans to fulfill his duty, regardless of their arrival. Amused, Todoro unleashes a full power attack, commanding Regine to charge. After skirting death so many times, his time has finally come, so the soldier decides to greet death with dignity. Thinking about his friends, he leaves the rest to them. Suddenly, a woman wearing a robe and a witch's hat appears before him and blocks the lightning completely. She says he really does have a death wish, but he's just shocked to see Winnie there. Winnie arrives on the scene and scolds Hawk for trying to get himself killed. Remembering a distant memory, she says it must be the influence of his journey. Todoro calls her attention, still mad about getting his attack blocked. While she interrupted their battle, she had no intention of fighting him and only came to give her friend a sword. She went rushing, after seeing him fight with a wooden sword. Unsheathing it, he somewhat feels life emanating from the blade, and even Juscelino acknowledges its power. Its name is Air, the treasure of heaven, which used to be wielded by Frau. It can essentially cut through anything it wants to, so the rest depends on his skill. That said, his confidence skyrocketed, having faith in the witch and his swordsmanship. Meanwhile, Basso is finishing things up on his end, but the hair folk survived his cannon and got up. Since Atla left her with some power, she's still fully capable of fighting. With this, her eyes turn red and her dark form returns. With a single move, the eagle's wing is cut off, and with another, his head falls to the ground. Finished, Frau tries to head to her comrades, but passes out from overexertion. Carrot runs away from Shinki's barrage, 
passing through the city and making it to the protective wall. Risking it, she dodges a hit and feints a cannon attack. With his hand stuck in the wall, he takes the full power of her punch and loses consciousness. Miragi questions Sally's resolve, asking how she plans to protect people with a power she can't even control. Hearing that she'll do it regardless, he laughs and surrenders, explaining that he was testing her. She wonders why her eye didn't react to him, but he avoids answering by reminding her that her friend is in trouble. Before leaving, she says she'll figure things out with Miko first, then extend her hand to him next, in hopes of coexistence. Meanwhile, Hawk is doing well against Totoro. In disbelief, the boy sees his horn cover and remembers the time when Carrot gave it to him, allowing him to control his lightning better. As he's reminded of the reason he's there, power surges out of him and the Raijin is summoned one more time. On the other hand, Shinki asks Carrot why she looks so pained, despite defeating the person who just tried to kill her. Realistically speaking, they haven't suffered at the hands of humans yet, but it's apparent how lowly they think of them. It's the same with ogres. His grotesque form drew discrimination, and Totoro was the only one who treated him normally, and even gave him a name. Human-looking ogres like them could likely coexist, but those with unnatural features won't have a place in their new world. Seeing her cry for him, he hopes that there are more people like her. Wanting to end things, the Regine is looser and more violent than before. Winnie reminds Hawk to wield it with faith. Doing just that, he cuts the lightning beast in half, even slashing its summoner across his chest. Todoro falls, and the battle ends. However, the boy wakes up in an inn, covered in bandages beside Carrot. Seeing her, he thinks that he must have died, and falls to tears as he realizes that she's alive and well. Outside, Hawk admits that he fully intended to kill the boy, hating him for killing an innocent man. However, the boy only attacked, thinking that they killed Carrot. Things might have ended differently if they had taken the time to clarify things. However, that would have left his resentment hanging. Sally is pained over their decisions and encourages everyone to find a way without fighting. Winnie is amused by her stubborn answer and suggests that they head to the country of Legidia, the one place in the world that has outlawed discrimination. Miko finally wakes up, still boiling with bloodlust for ogres. His eyes blaze as Milia enters the room, but Dog luckily wakes him up in time. She figured that he'd be in a bad mood after being put to sleep by Daminki, who forces people near him to sleep and plagues them with nightmares. Winnie heads home, promising to check up on them every day. To everyone's surprise, Sally invites Todoro into their group, not to travel with them, but to share the goal of coexistence. There are various ogres out there, and she thinks he's one of those worth the effort to convince. Frau clarifies the invitation with a philosophical interpretation, making him question his purpose in life. He looks at Carrot. There's friction among the ogres, as Miragi's coexistence faction gains traction. He comes close, but rejects her hand, saying he'll never work with humans. While surprised, his friend translates that he's simply too embarrassed to shake her hand, but wants to share in their objective. The boy heads out, telling Carrot to stay behind and protect the home she's found. With newfound trust in humanity, he encounters Miragi outside and questions why he tricked him, leading to the deaths of Shinki and Basso. As an apology, he sends the boy to join them, driving a hole in his chest. He asks him to send his regards to those up in heaven. With this, they all headed to Legadia. Once upon a time, a young man was leaving his home. He was given food for his travels, and a beautiful katana meant to protect him from the hostile creatures outside. Nicknamed Peachy, his name was Hiko no Miko. On the road, he gives his food to a dog and is surprised to hear it thank him. It immediately tells him to calm down, well aware of one's usual reaction to a talking dog. Just like that, they decide to travel together. He shares how he's looking for his parents, to ask why they put him in a peach, and sent him floating down the river. Suddenly, an ogre appeared at the village they were in, ruthlessly devouring its residents. Despite trembling in fear, he grips his sword and calls out to stop the beast, all while terribly stuttering. Everyone is shocked as he stops its fist with one hand. Claiming the name Peach Boy, he swiftly slices the ogre in half. Realizing that he killed it, power shines in his eyes. Everyone rushed to thank him. Rumors quickly spread, and villages being terrorized by ogres soon came to him for help. The man's onslaught on ogres continued, cutting down each one that came his way. Forgetting his mission to find his parents, he set off to Ogre Island, 
hoping it had put an end to things by killing their leader. Moreover, in exchange for one meal, Dog chose to accompany him through it all. Hiko accomplished what he came there for, defeating the leader and forcing them all to leave. However, he was warned that without them, the Kishin would come. Deemed a hero, he made a home in the mountains. Worried about the leader's warning and not wanting to get anyone else involved, he made excuses not to see those who raised him, but he was lonely inside. One night, an ogre came to him on his knees. He had fallen in love and made a family with a human. However, his instincts overwhelmed him, and he devoured his wife. Worried that his son is next, he begs the ogre killer to take his life, certain that his child will be left with good people. However, one day in the village, he came upon the residents, violently beating a defenseless child. He tells them to stop, but they're filled with hatred, as the child is an ogre, just like the monsters that slaughtered their families. No amount of negotiating would work, so Hiko decided to put the child under his protection. That was the day he met Miko. In his home, the child asks him to end his life, already tired of hurting. Just then, he revealed that he was the one who killed his father. Giving a clear view of his neck, he tells the boy to take revenge. Filled with loss and anger, the boy slashes with killing intent, but he's far too weak to do anything. As such, Hiko tells him to get strong enough to kill him. Until that day comes, he will be under his care. Later, he tells Dog that he has no intention to share how the father begged to be killed. Filled with sympathy, he thinks about what the child went through and insists that he must be given someone to hate instead of being left to believe that he was just unlucky. He whispers, but the boy hears this all while pretending to sleep. From there, he taught the child how to read, hunt, and even if he wasn't good at it, make fire. Their relationship grew closer but the child still refused to say his name. So, Hiko offered his, and the boy was thus named Miko. They found happiness in each other, but it didn't last long, as Noburega of the Kishin arrived. One night the boy came of age, and was thus offered another shot at revenge for his father. Refusing, the boy ran away. Dog questions his action, but his eyes glow with power, well aware of the Kishin approaching. He finally finds Miko, who says he wants to stay there forever. Instead, he's encouraged to go on a journey and find people who'll accept him for who he is. Hiko promises to accompany him, but acknowledges that it will be hard. They make a promise. Whenever things get tough, the boy should brush it off with a smile, and the man will come to protect him. One night, Miko suddenly felt a familiar feeling, similar to when his father went missing. As he's running, Dog blocks his way and tells him to turn back, but it doesn't work. Traces of a huge battle show and Hiko lies on the ground, his limbs torn off. As Noburega leaves, he makes one last swipe, but barely wounds the Kishin's cheek. Inches from death, he sees the moon shaped like a dumpling and questions why Miko came to him. The child is in shock and tears. He gives the boy a weak smile and lectures him one last time about the journey he's about to take. Understanding his fear, he reminds him of his promise to protect him. As such, he leaves him his sword to protect himself and others, and to stay happy. A peach-colored light exits his body and enters the boys. Just then, a huge blast from the Kishin hits them. However, the boy walks to Noburega, dragging the blade and completely unharmed. Strengthened by his master's blade, Miko's horn grew larger as he instantly cut the enemy's hand off. He cuts the Kishin down and tears his horn off. He'll end the battle between ogres and humans simply by killing them all. As Milia carries a sleeping Miko on her back, Dog says he'll always have a hole in his heart until the day he meets a person whom he can share a genuine smile.